This is an AMA style review for Organizational Behavior and Leadership PA 910. So you might ask yourself, why are we doing another AMA style review? 20% of your discussion board's grade comes from your usage of AMA style. So I'm just here to reinforce some of the um, things that you might have learned in PA 960 and to build on the knowledge that you already have. So the purpose of this recording is to review common errors and reinforce AMA style rules. I would like to remind everybody that we do utilize AMA style guide 11th edition. The 11th edition is available um, through your Moodle course and it's easy by clicking on it. I will show you how to do that in a few minutes. We are also going to go over referencing, levels of heading, referring to authors within the text. We're going to go over some capitalization rules, talk about acronyms and how and when to use them, and review the proper steps and proofreading process. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about avoiding plagiarism, direct quote versus paraphrasing. So first of all, we're going to talk about referencing using the AMA um, 11th edition guide. I always caution students to not utilize the website or the internet. Do not just Google AMA rule for referencing a book or AMA rule for referencing a journal because there are different editions of the AMA style guide. The 11th edition was released about a year and a half ago and we did adopt that as the um, standard for the program. The AMA style guide is easily accessed for free through your course within Moodle. So if you just click on your course and you go to the right hand side, you will see a link. And if you just click on that link, it will bring you up to the University of Lynchburg's library's logon page. And it'll ask you to log on. And you can see here, it says 11th edition. You just click on the AMA manual of style, 11th edition and it will bring up the AMA style guide. Now, I do wanna point out one thing. You can look at previous editions, like the 10th edition, um, by clicking here, but primarily for this course and for what we do within the University of Lynchburg, we use the 11th edition. But let's say maybe you had some homework to do or you're writing for another journal and they require 10th edition, you can easily get that through the Lynchburg Library as well. So if you have a question in regards to an AMA rule, this is where I would tell you to go. And you can see here, there are different chapters. There's chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, which talks about referencing. And this is where we will primarily stay in this first part of the presentation. But let's just say that you had a question about how do I reference um, ophthalmology terms? You can scroll down here and it shows different types of nomenclature for ophthalmology. You may want to figure out how to talk about titles and headings right here in chapter 10. So this is where you should go if you ever have any question in regards to an AMA style rule. So now let's go back to the presentation. So now let's talk about the most commonly cited um, things in our program. You will commonly cite books, references, and websites. We're gonna go over those three items in this presentation, but now you know how to access the anime style guide. So let's say you want to learn how to reference a package insert for a particular medication, you can go to the AMA style guide and look for the, the rule in regards to that. So we're gonna hit the three big ones, books, articles, and websites. And from there, um, you will become pretty proficient in those. And anything outside of that, you'll have to look up in the AMA style guide. So let's talk about referencing books. One of the big things um, that has changed from the 10th edition to the 11th edition of the AMA style guide is the city and states of the publisher is no longer uh, needed to be included in the reference. So I included here the proper citation for the book that we utilize in our course. And that book is written by Nancy Borkowski and Kathleen Meese. It's called Organizational Behavior in Healthcare and it's the fourth edition. 
The publisher is Jones and Bartlett Learning and it was published in 2021. I want you to take note that the name of the book is italicized. The incorrect way to do this would be including Burlington, Massachusetts. If you include Burlington, Massachusetts in this reference, then you're actually utilizing the 10th edition. Um, so that would be incorrect. So make sure that you do not include city and state in books and that you also ital italicize the book title. If you use a specific range of pages in a book, the numbers are noted at the end of the reference. So you can see here, we just added a colon after the year that it was published. And then immediately without placing any spaces, we put in a page range. So page 69 through 72. So you do not use a semicolon, it is actually a colon. And again, make sure you follow with a number right after the semicolon, there's no space. So that's how you reference a specific page range in a, within a book. So referencing um, journal articles. There are some general rules that you have to follow for referencing journal articles. The name of all authors should be given unless there are six or unless there are more than six, in which case you would only list the first three authors and then you follow the first three authors name by the um, word et al. The first word of the journal article is capitalized in any proper nouns within the title. And then the journal names should be abbreviated and italicized. So what do I mean by abbreviation? There is a, a listing in the National Center of Biotechnical Information, the NCBI, that allows you to learn how to shorten the names of journal art, journals. And why do we do that? Within the AMA style, Keep in the back of your mind that the goal is to use the fewest amount of characters as possible, which is much different from APA style, which you may have pre previously used. So I'm going to cut and paste this link right here. And it will take you to the University of Lynchburg's um, website. And you can type in a journal that you're using and how you want to potentially, and it will tell you how to potentially um, abbreviate that. So I want to look up how to abbreviate the Journal of American Academy of Physician Assistants. And you search. So I want to look up the Journal of American Academy of Physician Assistants. And you can see here, there are two potential abbreviations. But if you click on the second one, let's look at the second one first. It shows that this is the abbreviation for any journal article that was written between 1988 to 1994. The publisher was Mosby in St. Louis. Let's go back. And if you click on the top link, it tells you that this publication started in 1994. So basically what happened in 1994, JAPA changed publishers and when they changed publishers, it changed the abbreviation. So here is the abbreviation on um, JAPA. So instead of writing out Journal of American Academy of Physician Assistants, you would just abbreviate it J-A-A-P-A. -A -A. Let's look at another example. Let's do JAMA Neurology. And if you click on JAMA Neurology, the abbreviation is J-A-M-A-N-E-U-R-O-L. Again, it's just a way to shorten the abbreviation. Now let's return back to the PowerPoint presentation. One thing to note that we never include ISBN numbers or PMCID numbers in references um, within the reference page. So here are two examples of how to reference journal articles. The journal on the left has an example of one through six authors. And the example on the right hand side is something um, as an article that has more than six authors. 
So on the left hand side, you can see it has the author's name. There's no comma after the author's last name. And then it's the initial. So the United States is a proper noun. So the U in United is capitalized. The S in state is capitalized. And then you finish out the title, healthcare reform. And then you have a colon. Anything after the colon is called the subtitle. The subtitle is also not capitalized. Sometimes you'll see that first word after a, after a subtitle capitalized is not. It should be small letters as well. So you only capitalize the first word and then any proper nouns within the title. You can see next the after the journal title and subtitle is the journal name abbreviated, just like we talked about earlier. It's JAMA. And you will see that it's italicized. Then you have a period and then the year that the journal was published with a colon. And then you have the volume number, parentheses, the issue number, close parentheses, colon, and then the page range. And then finally, you include the DOI. The DOI does not have a period at the end. If you include a period at the end after a DOI, it will throw the DOI off and you will not be able to uh, cut and paste that uh, into a web browser and find it easily. So let's go to the second example. That second example is an example of greater than six authors. You will see that there are six authors, but only the first three are listed. Again, the last name is capitalized. There's no comma after the last name. And then there is the first initial. There's no period after the initial. Then you add a comma and you add two, the next two authors' names, comma, at all, period. And then you include the title. This does not have a subtitle. You will then include the journal name, and you will see here, this is JAMA Pediatrics, abbreviated as shown in the example. Then period, the year that it was published, colon, and then you will have the volume number, open parentheses, issue, close parentheses, and then e-locator number, and then the DOI. So again, keep in mind, the goal is to keep the amount of characters to the minimum. That's why we don't put commas after last names. That's why we don't put periods after initials unless it's the very last author. And again, do not put a period at the end of a DOI. So here are some examples. The top example is the incorrect way to do this. And this is what I'm talking about. You do not put a comma after the last name. You do not put periods after the initials. You just write it out like you see the correct version below. It's last name capitalized and then uh, first initial, second initial if it's noted, and then a comma. So make sure that's one of the first things when I'm evaluating your references. If I see all these periods and commas in your reference, I understand that you didn't carefully check. And you have to check because even sometimes when you use generation um, uh, citation generators, they will put these commas and periods in there. Citation generators will only be about 80% correct normally. So you have to make sure that anytime you have a citation generated for you, that you make sure that you are still double checking what is being spit out for you. And then here you can also see there's a period at the end of this DOI and there is no period at the, at the end of the DOI. The journal name is abbreviated, which is great. And the journal name is italicized and that's what we wanna see. Let's look at another example. The first example uh, is the incorrect way to do this and the bottom example is the correct way to do this. So you will notice that the author um, on the top example did the names correctly, but when they started to write the article's name, instead of just capitalizing the first letter, they capitalized every single solitary letter um, in the journal article's name and that is incorrect. Only the first word of journal articles are capitalized. Note that Alzheimer's is not highlighted because it's named after Dr. Alzheimer's. Therefore, it is a proper noun and should be capitalized. 
you also do not capitalize the first word of a subtitle. So the subtitle here is a cross-sectional study. So you would not capitalize the letter A, it would be small. So the correct way to do this is shown below. All the letters are small with the exception of Alzheimer's to include the letter A in a cross-sectional study. So let's talk about another example here. In this example, they got the names correct. The journal article title is correct, but they failed to abbreviate the journal title. So the journal is the Journal of American Medical Association of Neurology. And so the journal name is not abbreviated based on the NCBI NLM database that we talked about. So we also did not italicize the journal name in this example. So as you see below, the journal name has been italicized and it has been abbreviated. And then finally, review every single reference, even if it is generated um, by citation generators such as Zotero or RefWorks. Make sure your generator is set to the AMA style 11th edition. I sh will note that APA style is drastically different than AMA style. The example below is an APA style um, citation versus an AMA style citation. And what you'll notice right off the bat is how much shorter the AMA style citation is. But what I look for whenever I'm grading, if I see the names formatted incorrectly, the first thing I look for is if there's a comma after the last name and periods after the initials, that's a good telltale sign that um, the student is using APA format rather than AMA format. And the next telltale sign that it's an AMA or APA format versus AMA format is in APA, the year of publication follows the author so if you see that, you need to stop and think to yourself, my citation generator is set to APA and not AMA 11th edition. So again, you can see this bottom example is much shorter than the example above in it that um, utilizes APA style. The final thing that we're gonna talk about is referencing websites. And again, this changed from the 10th edition to the 11th edition. And I wouldn't say it changed drastically, but it did change enough that you have to be on the lookout to make sure that things are being generated in 11th edition. So the things that are included in references from websites are the authors, surnames and initials if given, and the names of all authors should be given unless there's more than six, which case you would only list the first three and then follow by et al. It's exactly the same way as you um, the rule with, with utilizing it in writing with journal articles. Then you would put the title of the specific item cited. If none is given, then you use the name of the organization responsible for the site. Then you can name the website. And then the next thing that you put is the publish date. Now, you will see in brackets, it says date published, and then the next two items, date, date. You would, where those brackets are, you would insert the date. Now, I do want to note, want you to note that on the published date, the word published is not in front of the actual date. The word published is implied. And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about in just a second. Then, following the published date is the updated date. Has this website been updated? Sometimes it's published in 2010 and then it's updated in 2016. Usually if you find updated dates, they're generally at the bottom of the web page. So make sure you're scrolling throughout the whole web page looking for an updated date. And then finally, the accessed date. You would write the word accessed and then follow it by the date that you accessed it. That lets the reader know that it, when you accessed it, just in case that link no longer is working, it tells them how recently you accessed that. And then finally, the URL. Verify that the link still works as close to publication as possible. So let's look at some examples of this. Here are six different examples. And what you will notice in all six of these examples, there is an accessed date. 
So every single one has to have an access date. You have to tell when you accessed it. You might not be able to find a published date. You also may not be able to find an updated date. Those may not be there, but you should 100% across the board always have an access date. And the thing that you will also notice that the URL is always at the end of the citation. So let's look at some examples. So in example number two, this example did have an author. The author's name was Charlton G. In example number one, there was no author's name. So they inserted the um, organization who is responsible for the website. Let's go down to example number three. There was a name on the website. It was called Zika Travel Information and the website was published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I would like you to see here on this example, there was a published date. The published date was January 26, 2016. But note, the word published does not precede that date. The word published is implied. You do have to use the word update before any updated date, and you do have to use the word accessed before any access dates. Those are not implied. So there are some examples of um, specific websites. So I just wanna point out one thing. I'm gonna compare a 10th edition website reference to an 11th edition website um, reference. So on the 10th edition, we're gonna use that Zika travel information uh, example. So you will see the Zika travel information and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are the same, but notice how in the 10th edition that the URL follows directly behind, and that has changed in the 11th edition. The 11th edition, you need to put the date that it was published and then the date that it was updated and then the date that it was accessed and then follow it with the, um, with the URL address. So there are slight differences between 10th edition and 11th edition, so make sure you're aware of how those are referenced in the 11th edition so that if a citation generator generates it, you can pick out that, oh gosh, they generated that in the 10th edition format versus the 11th edition. And then one thing I wanna talk about that we use extensively in PA 910, but you won't use um, maybe as much in other um, areas of this program is how to utilize or how to reference a TED Talk. So TED Talks, um, the AMA style re recommends citing electronic video content such as TED Talks as an online conference presentation. And the citation would adhere to the following structure. So author, title of presentation, where it was presented, the date of the presentation, the location of the presentation, the URL, and the date the URL was accessed. So let's take an example, or let's take a look at an example of that. So here's an example of a TED Talk that is by Regina Hartley. It's called Why the Best Hire Might Not Have the Perfect Resume. So one thing to note on TED Talks is this may look like the title, but actually TED Talks are categorized by the author. And so the author's first and last name always precedes what you see as the title of the presentation. So if you click on this YouTube link and you go to it, you will see at the title why the best hire might not be the perfect resume, but the actual title is Regina Hartley because TED Talks are cataloged by the author's first and last name that is actually included in the title of the talk. And then you will see here that I put in where the TED Talk occurred and um, the date that occurred, and that might not always be readily visible. You may have to do some digging for that, and maybe down lower in the page, it may be presented within the TED Talk. So on this particular TED Talk, I think there was like a flash on the slide that said that this was presented at TED at UPS in Atlanta, Georgia. So it may not be, um, you know, easily found, but you have to kind of go and look for the information. So just note that TED Talks, you have to put the last name of the author and then the first name, and that accounts for the author. 
But then on the title, you take the title of the presentation and you add the author's or the presenter's first and last name in front of it, like you see in the second correct example. Now we're going to talk about levels of heading. In the um, self-reflection paper that you will do in week eight, we use levels of heading. And this is the this is the time in the program that we teach levels of uh, level headings. So level headings are meant to divide primary parts into secondary parts and so on. And there should be a minimum of two. So if you use one level one heading, you have to at least use two level one headings. If you use one level two heading, you have to have at least two level two headings and so on and so forth. Headings reflect the progression of logic or the flow of thought in an article and thereby gu um, guide the reader and helps them keep oriented within the paper. They help break up the article and by making it more approachable. So this is what level headings look like. A level heading, level one heading, all the words and letters are capitalized. So you can see every single letter in a level one heading is capitalized and it is bolded. It is left justified. A level two heading is also left justified, but only the first letter of major words are capitalized. So the L in level is capitalized, the T in two is capitalized, and the H in heading is capitalized. It is also completely bolded and it's left justified. A level three heading is also bolded. It is indented and only the first letter of the level three heading is capitalized. You follow the level three heading with a period and then you start the text after the level three heading. So let's give you a couple of examples of this. So first of all, here is the actual level headings that you will use on your self-reflection paper. So you will write an introduction, which is a level one heading. You will have a discussion, which is also a level one heading. And then you're gonna have a conclusion, which is the level one heading as well. Under discussion, you are going to have three level two headings. The first level two heading is impact of leadership style. The second is SWOT analysis. And the third is future goals. And then finally, you're gonna have four level three headings. You will have strengths, period, and then you start the paragraph and tab weaknesses, period, and then start your paragraph opportunities and threats. So you will see I have used a level one. I have to have at least two level one headings and I actually have three. If I use a level two heading, I have to have at least two level two headings and I actually have three. So I have one, two, and three. And if I use a level three heading, I have to have at least two level three headings, but I actually have four level three headings. So those exam are examples of leveled headings as you will apply them in your self-reflection paper in this class. Let's talk about referring to authors in the text. Sometimes you want to mention in the text um, that an author of a study did X, Y, or Z, that they studied some particular disease process and this was their finding. So when mentioning um, authors in the text, you only use the surnames off the author's surname. For example, if you wanted to mention an article that I wrote, you wouldn't say Nancy Reed reported on acute compartment syndrome. You would only say Reed. You would only use my last name. For a two author reference, you would list both surnames. For references of more than two authors or authors in a group, include the first, first author's surname followed by et al or the word and associates or and colleagues. So here's an example. Doe reported on the survey. So that's one author. And anytime you mention an author in the text of your writing, you have to use a reference. You have to reference. And this is particularly important because you may have 
an author who has two or three studies. So I did an, uh, a paper on breast implants and one author published five or six different studies and I would talk about him and in order to, to point to which study I was talking about, I had to reference which, which study I was talking about. So you have to make sure anytime you utilize an author's name that you have a superscript pointing to what reference it is pointing to on the reference page. On the second example, Doe and Roe reported in a survey. So you use the author's surnames, you did not use their first names, and you join them by the word and. And then finally, if there's more than two authors, you use only the first, first author's last name and follow it by et al. You will notice that I did not put a period after the abbreviation all. And another alternative way of writing this is Doe and colleagues or Doe and associates. So do not use the possessive form of et al's, rephrase the sentence. So the data of Doe et al supports our findings as one example of how you would rephrase that. And again, there's no period after the word et al in the sentence. So here's an example of a uh, paragraph that utilizes one author, two authors, and three authors. And I'm going to take a, a time here to also note that when you write, the first number that you utilize becomes the first number on your reference page. The second becomes the second reference. So you, you will number references as you go and the first one you use is one the second one you use is two the next one you use is three and then you will order them on your reference page in that particular order so this first um, sentence acute compartment syndrome can increase trauma patients morbidity and mortality rate if not identified and treated early so this was noted in all three of these studies so one two and three so I have put them down in order one, two, and three. Then I talk about Cone and Indaba. So the way I wrote that is Cone and Indaba noted that classic symptoms of acute compartment syndrome can be deceiving due to the late presentation. So you look down here on the second reference and it's two authors. So I wrote about them. I used just their last name and joined it by and. And then the next that I talk about is Lola and or Lolo. Lolo is a single author and so I just put that person's name. I followed it with the superscript and it's the first one in the order. And then finally, Whiteside et al. This had more than three or more than two authors. So when I write about it within the text, I only use the first author's last name. I use at all, and then I follow it with a superscript. There's no period. So this is just an example of how you would reference in the text, which sometimes gets people confused with what it looks like on the reference page. On the reference page, you will list out all the authors up to the first six. After the first six, you shorten it to three authors and follow it by et al. So that's why on this example number three, there was four authors. So I had to list all four of them out. But when I talked about them within the text, I only utilized the first author's last name within the text and followed it by et al. So don't get confused on how you reference something in text versus reference it on the reference page. So now we're going to talk about capitalization. What writers, new writers, uh, tend to do is they tend to um, overutilize capitalization in their writing. So we're going to go over some of the rules. And as you will see throughout this presentation, down in the bottom right hand corner, I have referenced where I got this rule out within the AMA style guide. So this is section 10.2. So Again, titles of medical art articles. The titles of a medical article look different if you're writing about them within text versus writing about them 
in the reference page. So titles of articles take initial capitals when they appear as titles in the text, but not when they appear in a reference list. So if I want to talk about this uh, particular journal article in the text, I might say a article was written uh, entitled Free Tissue Transfer for Head and Neck Reconstruction, a Contemporary Review. And so I'm talking about it in text. And when I do that, I do capitalize all the first letter of every major word for not being considered a major word and and not being um, considered a major word as well as the first letter or the first word after a colon which represents the subtitle so the subtitle here is a contemporary review now typically a is considered a minor word and you would not capitalize it but because it's a subtitle and you're writing about it in text it does get a capitalization now, if I were to reference this same article on a reference page, it would look much different. I would only capitalize the first letter of the journal title, and I would not capitalize the A as the subtitle. So make sure you don't get confused on that. If you're writing about a specific title of a medical article in the text you do capitalize but on the reference page you do not here's another thing that gets confusing is when we start talking about nationalities and um, racial categories and things like that so capitalized names of languages nationalities racial categories ethnicities political parties religion and religious denominations do not capitalize political doctrines such as somebody's progressive or conservative or general forms of government such as democracy or monarchy. Capitalize black and white as a designation of race. Avoid using in noun form. So example over here on the right is white patients. You would capitalize the word white. Um, so here's the examples on the right hand side. Um, just to kind of help keep you oriented in what these rules are saying. The next thing is events, awards, and legislations. Capitalize the names of historical or special events, historical periods, and awards, but not common nouns that may follow the names. So for instance, a common noun that follows a name. So you would capitalize Nobel Prize, but you would not capitalize the word winner. You would capitalize Civil War as a historical period, but you would not capitalize the word error. So you can see the examples on the right hand side. This next part um, is comes into play a lot in medical writing. So proprietary names. You do capitalize trademarks, proprietary names of drugs, and brand names of manufactured products and equipment. You do not capitalize generic names or descriptive terms and do not include trademark or copyright symbols after, after proprietary or brand names. And if you look in the PowerPoint presentation that I will include uh, in the Moodle page, there's some more guidance in the notes section. But the example below shows that diphenhydramine is the generic name, so it is not capitalized but it also includes the word Benadryl, which is the um, proprietary name followed by the maker. So that is an example of how you handle generic names versus trade names. And again, make sure you are not using the trademark or copyrighted symbols within um, medical writing. And then finally, test. Whenever we talk about tests, it's it comes into play a lot of times in neurology and orthopedics. The exact and complete titles of the test and subscales of the test should be capitalized, but the word test is not usually capitalized except when it is part of the official name. So an example that I would give if you do the Faber test, which is an orthopedic test, um, the F is capitalized, but the word test is not. And, um, Here's some other examples. The Minnesota, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. You would 
capitalize that entire um, that entire phrase because those are all proper nouns. I see this uh, many times in medical writing um, done improperly as well. Titles and degrees of a person. You capitalize a person's title when it precedes the person's name, but not when it follows the name. So an example of this is program chair Allison Hemings is to be congratulated on our successful meeting. But if you wrote it a different way, saying Allison Hemings was named program chair in 2015 annual meeting, because it does not precede her name, you would not capitalize program chair. Dr. Colvin um, served as principal investigator. Principal investigator does not precede his name, so you would not capitalize it. But if you rephrased it differently and you said principal investigator, Douglas Colvin, MD, directed the SRP, or SIPR trial, then you would capitalize principal investigator. So capitalize academic degrees when abbreviated, but not written out. So Sharita Evans, MA, you would um, capitalize that. But if you wrote out Shariva, Sharita Evans received her master's degree from Vanderbilt University, you would not capitalize master's degree. And finally, um, the one that is in our program that is constantly overutilized is the capitalization of physician assistant and nurse practitioner. And then we're going to throw a doctor in there because most of you, if you're in your writing, you would not capitalize the word doctor. But for some reason, you want to capitalize the word physician assistant or nurse practitioner. And names of occupations are not capitalized. It should also be noted that names of departments within hospitals are not capitalized. For, so, for example, the emergency room is not capitalized. Critical care unit is not capitalized. So avoid overcapitalizing medical terms. Ask yourself, is it a proper noun? And if not, then don't capitalize it. And now we're gonna review acronyms. So acronyms, um, define the acronym first before you utilize it in the text, and then you can use the acronym itself every time thereafter. So here's an example. The World Health Organization and you follow it by an open parentheses, capital W, capital H, capital O, close parentheses, works with various organizations throughout the world. And then every time after that, when you mention the World Health Organization, you can just write it as capital W, capital H, capital O. Do not capitalize the words from which an acronym is taking the place of if it is not a proper noun. So World Health Organization is a proper noun, so we capitalized it when we wrote it out. And then whenever we use the acronym, we also capitalize the acronym. So if we're talking about prostate-specific antigen, we would not capitalize the P in prostate, the S in specific, and the A in antigen because it's not a proper noun but you would capitalize the PSA. And every time thereafter that you would talk about PSA, you could use the abbreviation PSA and not utilize it in parentheses. And the exception to the capitalization rule, like I said, is if the words that make up the acronym are proper nouns, then you would precede that acronym with the World Health Organization written with a capital W, capital H, capital O. But in general, if it's not a proper noun, you do not capitalize it. So here's another thing that we also sometimes do. When there has been a stretch, meaning um, it didn't quite make up a great acronym, but we wanted to make up an acronym that we could say easily, um, to create the study name or the name of the writing group that makes sense is easy to say or somewhat relates to the name of the group, but where the first letter of the major words do not match the acronym, do not use any kind of crazy capitalization to indicate how the study name was derived. You literally just capitalize the first letter of the study name and then put in parentheses. So for instance, the third example is a pretty good example the study's name is Clarity, but there's no L in the capitalized portion of the uh, 
letter or the words before it. So you would not capitalize the C and the L, making the L capitalized as well, kind of to print point how they got the study name. You literally just write out the study and then you put the study name in parentheses whether it makes good sense to the reader or not. Finally, whenever you've written something, you need to proofread it. And this is one thing that I find students cutting corners on, specifically when it comes to discussion board posts. So first of all, if you've not done so already, you need to install Grammarly on your computer. The free version is equally as works equally as well for this program as the paid version. Once you've written something, I recommend that you read it out loud, even your discussion board post, um, and then have someone read your writing out loud to you. You can hear things that are incorrect, but then sometimes you read what you know you wanted to say versus what is actually there. So by having someone read it out loud to you, then you can hear errors that you didn't hear when you read it out loud to yourself. Finally, look for overcapitalization, run on sentences, and then correct acronym uses. And one of the things I like to tell people, this is just a Nancy Reed rule of thumb when writing, it's nothing that you're gonna find in a textbook or anything, but we, we tend in medical writing to do a lot of run on sentences. And even though it may be grammatically correct, by shortening, shortening a sentence into two to three sentences, it adds clarity for the reader. So I always tell my students that if your sentence is more than two lines, you need to start looking at it and asking yourself, is, the way, is there a way that I can break this sentence down into multiple smaller sentences and still deliver the same message? So look for overcapitalization, run-ons, and then make sure you're using acronym usage correctly. First, spelling the word out that you're trying to abbreviate, adding the acronym, and then every time after that, utilizing the acronym. Also in proofreading, review your references, especially those created by citation generators and those from foreign journals. Citation generators are notorious for not converting foreign journal um, notation uh, references correctly. Also, in your writing, make sure that you um, use the superscript immediately after the punctuation. There is no space between the period and the superscript. References should be numbered consecutively with uh, Arabic numbers in the order in which they are cited in the text. So the first, the, the first reference that you talk about is reference one. The second reference that you talk about is reference two. And then you order them on the reference page how they appear in the text. So finally, let's talk about avoiding plagiarism using direct quote versus paraphrasing. So the, a direct quote is something that's taken word for word from the original quote. When you use direct quotes, you do have to use a double quotation mark and you have to follow it with a superscript after the quotation mark. If the quotation is over four lines, you have to use a block quote, meaning you have to make it smaller in size and you have to indent on the left hand and right hand side. But direct quotes require both quotation marks and a reference. But in AMA style, we prefer that you paraphrase. And paraphrasing is taking the original author's material and rewording it in a, a manner that it is not, that is your rewording, but it's taking their original thought. So putting a passenger idea from another person's work into your own words. It's generally shorter and more condensed than the original phrase. And paraphrase also gets referenced with a superscript, but you do not use quotation marks. So it's really important that you understand this, otherwise you can be um, considered plagiarizing something. And again, keep in mind, paraphrasing is what is preferred in AMA style. Now I'm gonna give you an example of when a direct quote is really important. Um, so I wrote a paper again on breast implants in one of the um, authors that I referenced, he made a statement in his 
in his review article, uh, I'm sorry, in his original research article, that said it's very, very important that clinicians outside of the plastic surgery world understand a particular disease process. And he worded it in a way that I thought made a powerful point. And because I didn't want to lose the power of that point, then I direct quoted that. But again, there was a specific reason I did a direct quote to add that powerful punch that that researcher was trying to make. So an example like that would be an example when you would sparsely use a direct quote in your writing. So here are a couple of miscellaneous references that will help you with your writing. Um, the top one is a capitalization um, reference. And then finally, using the word physician assistant correctly. And many times in our own writing, physician assistants use the uh, word physician assistant, or when they say PAs, they put apostrophe S after it. They incorrectly use it. So this website was put together on how to correctly use the word physician assistant and the abbreviation PAs. And then it should also be noted, noted that there are very few times when the word physician assistant or nurse practitioner should be capitalized. So this is the conclusion of this um, AMA style review. I know it's a lot and it's a long video, but it is going to um, pay you huge dividends, not only in this class, but going forward in your 960 series.